Welcome to Lockdown Conservation Science. I'm David Mills. I can be contacted at the email address on screen. Today's video covers some simple chemistry. Spe specifically, we're going to look at drawing and naming of molecules. And this is actually part one of a two part video because otherwise it would probably go on a bit too long and be a bit of an info dump. So hopefully you'll stick with this to the end and then catch the second part, which should be out in a couple of days time. Quick outline for this video, we'll have a quick recap of previous topics, quickly discuss the difference between organic and inorganic chemistry, we'll look at the different sorts of carbon bonds, and then following on from this we'll look at how the molecules are named, and we'll finish off by understanding how to draw some of these molecules. So the quick recap, atoms exist, they like to bond with other atoms. The bonds between atoms take one of three forms. They're either ionic, covalent or polar covalent. And we're specifically not mentioning bonds between molecules here. So we're not going to talk about hydrogen bonding or similar. We're only looking at the actual bonds between atoms. The periodic table is a useful source of information about elements. Some people have a favourite periodic table. This is my favourite one. It shows where we all come from, from stardust. Basically, there are two types of chemistry. There's organic chemistry, which is the chemistry of molecules containing carbon, specifically a carbon bonded to a hydrogen atom and some other atom. And then there's inorganic chemistry, which is the chemistry of absolutely everything else. In this video, we're only going to consider organic chemistry, although we may look at some inorganic chemistry in a future video, depending on what topics we get to cover. So now we know we're only going to be looking at carbon atoms and the things they can do, we need to know how to count them. I'll let you into a secret here. Scientists love to name things. And one thing scientists love even more than naming things is giving the same thing multiple names. And something scientists love even more than giving the same thing multiple names is giving them multiple names in different languages, especially if you can use Greek and Latin. That said, this is how you count up to the first 10 carbon atoms in a molecule. So in the table, you can see the prefix for the names, the number of carbon atoms, and an example of a molecule named such. So a molecule containing one carbon atom is given a name prefixed by meth or meth, depending on your accent and where you are on the planet and how you pronounce it. The example being methane or methane. Molecules containing two carbon atoms are prefixed by eth. So an example here would be ethane or ethanol which we're familiar with, and so on down the list. This is the simplest organic molecule. It's a single carbon atom, which as we know wants to have four bonds. And as we're keeping things very simple, we just attach a single hydrogen atom to each of those bonds. This forms methane, a colourless, odourless, flammable gas. As a link back to the previous video on bonds, we can also draw the Lewis diagram to really show that each of the bonds between carbon and hydrogen in methane is a pair of shared electrons in a covalent bond. All the bonds in this video will be covalent, although maybe towards the end there'll be a couple of polar covalent and I'll point these out as they occur. This is where we're going to introduce a little bit more terminology. In other words, scientists have been naming things again. If carbon atoms in molecules only have single bonds, then the molecule is called an alkane. It doesn't matter how many molecules or how many carbon atoms there are in the molecule, but if they're all bonded with single bonds between the carbons, the molecule is an alkane. So as on the previous slide, we're back to methane, which is the simplest alkane. There's no double bonds anywhere in this molecule. And we can see that the name methane here comes from the prefix meth, one carbon, and the suffix ane from alkane. So methane, meth, one carbon, ane, alkane. So with this knowledge, how would we go about 
describing this molecule. What would we name it? Well, we can see we've got two carbons and they're all single bonds. If we go back to our previous slide on naming atoms, we can see that two carbon atoms in a molecule means that the name is going to start with the prefix eth. So now we know this molecule is going to be called eth something. We know there are just single bonds between the carbons, so it's an alkane. So we put the prefix eth together with a suffix ane, and we get ethane. It really is that simple. Another thing we can note looking at this molecule is the hydrogens are attached. Hydrogen takes up every spare bond the carbon has. So ethane, it's a colourless, odourless gas, primarily used as an industrial chemical from which other chemicals are made. It's a feedstock chemical. So we know from a previous video that carbon can also form double bonds where two pairs of electrons are shared. So the molecule on this slide is the simplest one that can have a double bond. And we can check is this still valid if we count the bonds to each carbon. And we can see that each carbon has four bonds and so the molecule can exist. So again, we need a name for this type of molecule. Scientists naming things any molecule with a double bond is an alkene. Alkene as opposed to alkane for single bonds. Alkenes give the molecule suffix ene. So in this case we can see we've got two carbons, so the molecule is still going to begin F, and the suffix is ene, so we have ethene. Ethene is a colourless flammable gas. Um, with a faint sweet musky odour and it's mostly used um, to make polyethylene plastic and when we come on to look at polymers and organics in a later video we'll actually see how you, you turn this sort of gas into plastic. Now just for completeness we'll consider the case with carbon atoms triple bonded to other carbon atoms. The simplest one is shown here and this is called an alkyne, just to be different. So now we have alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. The carbon still has four bonds. Hydrogens fill up the remaining bonds. This is a molecule that can exist. It's, this molecule does exist. It's commonly called acetylene. It's used because it produces a very, very hot flame. So it's used in metal cutting and metal welding. But if we're going to name this according to our scheme for naming things, acetylene is the common name, but the correct name for it is ethine. Eth coming from two carbons, ine coming from triple bond. So we get ethine. That's quite a lot of information fairly quickly. So now might be a good time, pause the video, make a cup of tea or your beverage of choice. See if you can name the two molecules on this slide and see if you can also work out how many carbons and hydrogens are in decane. I'll provide the answers at the end of the video. Time to let you in on another secret. Scientists are lazy. Why spend all of our time drawing these C's and H's when instead we can just draw some lines? So first of all, we completely throw away the hydrogen and then we just draw a line everywhere there's a bond between carbon atoms. So in the example on the slide, we turn the whole ethane molecule into a single line. This line represents the bond between the two carbon atoms. We implicitly know that there's a carbon atom on each end of the line and hydrogens fill in all the other bonds. I said scientists were lazy, but it's not just laziness. When you get very complicated molecules, you don't actually need to see all the atoms explicitly. In fact, you might not have space on your page to draw in all of the C's and H's. So drawing molecules this way is called the skeletal form of the molecule. And you can kind of see if you take off all the C's and H's and just leave the bonds, you've got the skeleton of the molecule. So what do we do if we have many carbon atoms? Or for example, in this case, three. We can't just draw a single line 
because that only has two ends. And if each end is a carbon atom, you only have two ends, you can only have two carbon atoms. So the trick is we draw a wiggly line instead. So now we have a carbon at each end of the line and another where the line bends. Again, we don't show the hydrogen, but they're there implicitly. The molecule on this slide, by the way, is propane, a fairly common gas that most people will have heard of before, used as a fuel. We do exactly the same with double bonds. So in this case, we have a double bond between the first two carbon atoms and a single bond between the second and third. We draw this out as two parallel lines and then a single sloping line the other way. But you don't just have to have hydrogen attached to the carbon atoms. In fact, if you do that, you just get rather a lot of fairly boring chemicals. To make things more interesting, we can swap some of the hydrogens out for more electronegative atoms. So this is where we're going to start getting polar covalent bonds forming. So in the case of the molecule on this slide, we've taken three hydrogens and replaced them with chlorine. How do we go about naming this? We need a small digression into interestingness. There are very specific rules about how you name molecules, but we're going to wrap most of these up in the term interestingness. Of the two molecules on this carbon, we can certainly say one is more interesting than the other. The carbon on the right is only bonded to hydrogen and another carbon. It's fairly boring. The carbon on the left is bonded to three chlorines and another carbon. This is much more interesting. We will call the interesting carbon carbon number one and the other carbon carbon number two. We can now make an attempt at naming this molecule. We know if there was no chlorine, this would be called ethane. And we know there are three chlorines, so this is probably going to be called trichloroethane. Trichloro coming from three chlorines. We also know something else. We know all the three chlorines are on the number one carbon. So instead of just trichloroethane, we can actually more specifically name this molecule. All the carbon, all the chlorine is on carbon number one, so we put this on the name. And so this is actually called 1-1-1-trichloroethane. This is actually a fairly commonly used solvent that's now being mostly replaced because it causes damage to the ozone layer. Um, it's colourless, sweet smelling, used um, industrial dry cleaning, solvents. It was fairly common until about 20 years ago. Now this molecule on this slide is a fairly contrived example, but one that could exist. Each of the carbons is bonded to a chlorine. No one carbon is more interesting than the other, and the molecule is, in, is identical left to right, right to left. We can name this, it's three carbons, single bonded. So if we go back to our table of how you name carbons, we can see it would be called propane. And we have three chlorines on the molecule, so it would be trichloropropane. Again, we can be more specific and add in the positions of the chlorine atoms. So what we actually get is one, two, three trichloropropane. The one, two and the three being the positions where the chlorines are attached. This is actually a really nasty carcinogen and is absolutely not something you will work with in conservation. To extend the point a little further, let's consider this example. Here, we've switched one of the chlorine atoms from the previous molecule for a bromine atom. We've switched a halogen for an, a different halogen. We could name this 1,2-dichloro-3-bromopropane but we can apply the interestingness rule to the carbon. So the carbon attached to the bromine is more interesting than the carbons attached to the chlorine. It's also at the end of the molecule, so we can actually call that carbon, which is attached to the bromine, carbon number one. So now the name becomes 1-bromo-2-3-dichloropropane. I know nothing about this molecule, but given the previous one was horribly carcinogenic, and this one we've added bromine to, it's probably also hideously nasty. 
We can also draw this molecule in the lazy or skeletal form. And as you can see here, where the chlorines and the bromines attach. The next couple of examples are really just going to be for completeness and for the interest of the people that want to take this and investigate this a little bit further. Naming alkanes is fairly simple because there are no double bonds, so we don't have to worry about how they change the name depending on their position. But when you've got multiple double bonds in a molecule, how do you go about naming these things? If we consider the molecule on the right, it can exist and each of the carbons has four bonds. There are three carbons, so we would expect this to be called propene, but it's not quite that simple. If we remember, scientists really like naming things, and a molecule with two adjacent double bonds is called an allene. So a molecule shown is the simplest possible allene, and it's actually sometimes called allene. The more formal name is propadiene, and we can see that the prop part of the name comes from being three carbons, and diene comes because there's two adjacent double bonds. This molecule is actually a gas, similar to acetylene in a way. It burns at high temperature and is frequently used in specialised welding. Now, you really do not need to know this for conservation unless you happen to be conserving some random alien artefacts deep in space, a couple of light years away from any star, at temperatures really approaching absolute zero, because that's the sort of conditions these molecules like to exist in. They don't like heat, they don't like light, they don't like anything really. The general name for this type of molecule is cumuline. It's also actually the specific name for the molecule on the slide, but it's the generic name for molecules that have lots and lots of double bonds. I'm not going to develop much further in this video, but it's worth a quick mention here, especially as we may see molecules like this when we consider solvents, and in particular some of the so-called green solvents in a later video. As you can see, the molecule in the chart have exactly the same number of carbon atoms and each has exactly one double bond. So these are probably all some form of butene. You might come up with the name. But exactly where the double bond occurs changes the shape, structure and behaviour of the molecule. So they must actually have different names. If they look different, they behave different, they must be called something different. So we achieve this the naming of these molecules by numbering the bonds in the molecule. In the first example, we can kind of see how the name butuanine comes about. We have four carbon atoms, this gives us but, and we have one double bond at the start of the molecule. The name is arranged such that the position of the double bond is indicated by the number and the value of the number one, carbon number one, so we get butuanine. The next two examples are exactly the same molecule, except in the first of the two, the carbons, the other carbons are on the same side of the molecule. This is the cis form of the molecule. The other form of the molecule, where the other two carbons are on opposite sides of the molecule, is the trans form. You may also see these labelled with Z or E depending on which type of text you're reading and the age of um, papers or um, documentation you're reading, they may, they may call them cis or trans or Z or E, depending. The final example is more complicated because not all of the carbons are in a line. And now remembering the interestingness rule, the carbon that's bonded with the double bond and the other two carbons is the most interesting. So it forms the start of the name. And this is where we get 2-methylprop-1-ene. The longest chain of the carbon atoms is three. If you actually start counting carbon atoms in a line, no matter which where you start on the molecule, 
you can only get three in a line. The other carbon atom is kind of just hanging around. So this is actually propane. And the carbon that's hanging around on its own is a methyl. It's a single carbon methyl. So the name constructed is 2-methylprop-1-ene. That's about as complicated as we're going to get here. This is probably a good point to stop this video. We've covered quite a lot fairly quickly. We've met alkanes and alkenes, and we've learned how to name these molecules. We've also met some more complicated ones that have no use in conservation. We've learned how to draw these, and we've learned how to draw these the lazy way, the skeletal form. We've taken a quick trip to the depths of deep space to take a pick, peek at some of the stranger molecules that can exist. Perhaps one day one of you will venture into deep space and encounter some of these molecules that only like to exist in the incredible cold and away from light. In the second part of this video, which will follow soon, we'll look at what happens if you attach other atoms to carbon. A quick spoiler for the next video is if you attach oxygen to carbon, you make up most of the solvents which we're familiar with in conservation. But to get here, we're going to, well, to get there, we need to learn a little bit more fit theory first. If you found this video interesting, please give it a like on YouTube. Any questions or comments can be left in the comment section or sent to me on Twitter or via my email address at the start of the video. Thank you very much. And here are the answers to the questions earlier. So the first molecule is butane, four carbons, but, single bonded, ane. Second molecule, propane, which we've already met in this video. And decane, this is a good one to sketch out and convince yourself that this is correct. But we have 10 carbons from dec, ane, it's single bonded, decane. And when you sketch this out and draw in all the extra hydrogens, you get 22 hydrogens. So 10 carbon, 22 hydrogens.